How can we regain our power as individuals in a system that has overheated the planet at the expense of our ecosystems and communities? Social movements of the past show us that grassroots organizing has the potential to inspire change and bring a more vivid sense of justice to the social and environmental landscape of our planet. When one person stood up for civil rights, abolitionism, women's emancipation, or the rights of the LGBTQ community, they also tuned in to hear voices of recognition and solidarity call back. Today, despite the strong voices in the environmental movement, we often lose hope in what we can do on our own and tune out to the possibility to participate and demand change. Within the crisis created by global warming, this loss of hope is heightened by what some have called eco-anxiety, a sense of disempowerment in face of natural disaster and the fear of resignation to corporations and their interests. In an act of resistance, we started making this documentary. We wanted to identify the role of our local institutions, who we care about, and their placement within the large and faceless system that is perpetuating our climate predicament. By making this film, our micro-political actions sought to elevate the voices of our peers in the University of California, who are calling out in the crowd, mobilizing to change policy, and fighting to bring decision makers into the needs and demands of our time. How could we all, as students, alumni, staff, and faculty of the UC, bring to light the fallacy of carbon neutrality in the face of climate change, and instead invite decision makers to take truthful action on the well being of our cities, their ecosystems, and people? In order to do something, we accepted our complicity and used it to bring clarity. We rented a car with a 3.6 liter combustion engine to travel 1,500 miles across the state of California to interview UC student activists and professors, labor organizers, climate advocates, and grassroots leaders to reveal the facts behind the trending market of carbon offsets, carbon neutrality, natural gas, and of fossil fuels. During our trip, we burned 0.5 metric tons of CO2. But in comparison, the UC annually burns 1 million metric tons of CO2 through the operation of its 10 on-campus heating, cooling, and electricity plants. These plants are powered by fracked methane, also known as natural gas. Methane is 86 times more potent a greenhouse gas than CO2 and is a big moneymaker in the state of California, which is home to one of the largest gas utilities in the country, SoCal Gas, owned by Sempra Energy. Instead of cutting the emissions produced by burning oil and gas, corporations and institutions such as the UC often purchase carbon offsets an accounting measure that allows polluters to avoid taking genuine responsibility. At the UC, this strategy of buying offsets is called carbon neutrality. My name is Tajuri. I'm a literature class writing major and a climate change studies minor at UC San Diego, and I'm a current McNair scholar. My name is Dan Kamen, and I'm the chair of the Energy and Resources Group here at UC Berkeley. I'm also a professor in the Golden School of Public Policy and a professor in the Department of Nuclear Engineering. I'm a physicist by training. I've served at the World Bank. I've served at the United Nations. I've served in the US federal government, um, all in different capacities of science, technology for climate policy, for climate justice, and for environmental justice. I'm Stephanie Pincel. I am a professor at the Institute of the Environment and Sustainability at UCLA. I have a research center called the California Center for Sustainable Communities. 
my background is in theoretical physics. That's what my PhD is in. And I'm currently a climate scientist in the Department of Earth and Planetary Science here at UC Berkeley. And what I do, broadly speaking, is to study the physics of Earth's climate. The climate trajectory right now is dire. Uh, and it's dire because we are causing harm at an exponentially growing rate. And people throw that word exponential around fairly loosely, but I mean that in a mathematical sense, which is that the rate at which we are putting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere has, you know, it's had little wiggles up and down, but broadly speaking, it has been growing exponentially since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. So not only is the carbon dioxide level outside higher than it's been at any time since humans have walked the planet, but we are adding carbon dioxide to the atmosphere at the fastest rate now. The historical view of the environment has been, it's a environmental dumping ground. That environment is a resource, whether we're sucking up water from the Colorado River, or we're emitting pollution into waterways or the atmosphere, we've used nature historically as a dumping ground. That's a pure traditional capitalist bottom line. And the problem with that is that we can't just stop burning fossil fuels, stop adding car carbon dioxide to the atmosphere, and then expect the planet will return to its normal state. The, the temperature of the planet is unfortunately proportional to, and will be proportional to for many thousands of years, to the total amount of CO2 we put into the atmosphere. And that means that every bit of CO2 we put into the air now does permanent harm, permanent damage. And in my opinion, it's that permanence that makes global warming the most urgent crisis of our time. We have to remember that when you, when you use the hydrocarbon molecule at the way we do today, we uh, create poisons and other kinds of hazards. We're poisoning the soil, we're poisoning the water, we're poisoning our flesh, we're creating situations where children have asthma, there's high rates of cancer, and we're poisoning the environment. The Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change recently concluded that human-induced climate change is already affecting many weather and climate extremes in every region across the globe. Evidence of observed changes in extremes such as heat waves, heavy precipitation, droughts, and tropical cyclones, and in particular their attribution to human influence, have strengthened significantly since their last report in 2014. These historical issues talk about the overlap of natural and human histories and the failure of systematically seeing them as separate. Today, as we move beyond that idea, we recognize the ways in which our energy-dependent societies, governments, and institutions are interlinked with the well-being of ecosystems and human communities. As students, we think of paths forward and turn to the institutions that we are a part of, to the institutions that educate us and build the future through new thinking and a new workforce. How is the UC system facing one of the most important issues of our time? So for the McNair Scholars Program, I am interviewing UC administrators from across the entire system to really learn like administrators' thoughts on like the climate change, on UC emission policies, like are we doing enough, are we moving fast enough? And the good news is administrators all believe climate change is real. The bad news is the pace that they're moving or that they think that they're moving, that they think they're doing a good job, that they think they're doing enough. One administrator actually told me, they're like, we don't know what's gonna happen in a thousand years in regards to climate change. And I was just like, yeah, we don't know what's gonna happen in a thousand years, but like, we already see what's happening now. And so it's really, I'm hearing there's a lack of urgency from UC administrators. That was just one thing I've heard. And they're really, they're really hesitant to condemn themselves. It's just like so ridiculous that like Scripps is the one that's doing the research on climate change and like that's, the one that's like ringing the bell, like, oh, y'all, we need to be worried about this. And yet, you see San Diego, it's like, decarbonization, what's that? <laughs> like, y'all own scientists are ringing the alarm and things, and y'all aren't doing nothing. And so it's just like, you, not only would it like, set the standard, but it's like, you have to. Like, if the ones doing the research aren't alarmed appropriately, then what's the point of doing the research? 
So in 2013, UC announced the uh, Carbon Neutrality Initiative, where it would commit the university to carbon neutrality in 2025. And the language here is super important. They commit to carbon neutrality, not to being carbon free. Uh, carbon free would mean that the university stops burning fossil fuels. It means you start, you, you stop importing methane to burn to make electricity and for heating and cooling. Uh, and that's really the dominant thing that contributes to the university's carbon emissions. But that's what carbon free would mean. You just stop burning carbon. Carbon neutral means that we mainly continue, as usual, burning methane gas, but we buy these carbon offsets to atone for it. And so this has actually already begun on at least two campuses. They started buying carbon offsets. One of them is UC Merced, which recently announced that they had gone carbon neutral by having purchased these offsets. And so we inquired, we asked them, what carbon offsets did you buy? And they refused to tell us. And to me, that's just stunning that a UC campus would declare carbon neutrality, but then not actually show us any of the accounting, not actually tell us how they reach that, but telling us basically just trust us. Um, I, I just think that's stunning. It's honestly a scam because when you go on the UCOP website and you see and you read it, you see that it says reduce emissions. If you look at the campus carbon emission numbers from UC San Diego, UC Santa Barbara, UC Berkeley, emissions have barely gone down. And so like the benefit of the doubt has no longer been earned. It's not warranted. The challenge is that there's a practical side of the story and that is many institutions, not just the University of California, see carbon offsets as part of their solution set. Offsets are effectively a way to offload responsibility to others. It works like this. Uh, you emit some carbon dioxide by burning some fossil fuels, and then to atone for that, you buy a piece of paper, and on that piece of paper, it says that because you bought that piece of paper, somewhere else, at some other time, some carbon dioxide was prevented from going into the atmosphere, or some other greenhouse gas was prevented from going into the atmosphere. So I can give you an example, a fictional example, that is not that much worse than what actually happens. I could buy a gigantic tank, fill it with oil, and I could sit next to the tank with a match. <laughs> and I could, every day, write on a piece of paper that if no one buys this piece of paper, I'll light the tank of oil on fire, releasing CO2 to the atmosphere. Uh, and I call those things carbon offsets. I write carbon offset at the top, I emboss it with some official looking stamp, uh, and they get sold into the offset market. Well, every day someone buys that piece of paper so I don't light the tank of oil on fire. The alternate reality is where someone didn't buy the slip of paper and I set the tank of oil on fire. If it sounds like a scam, it's because it is. And like I said, many of the carbon offsets that are sold today and purchased are not much better than that. So every time we think about offsets, even if we have really well-designed ones, we're essentially shirking our responsibility to be the leader and to do the process right. That doesn't mean a great project on Native American land in California or investing in preserving a forest is a bad thing. Those are good projects. My argument is that those are things we should do on their merits, investing money to help out climate impacted populations, but to do it via our offset markets is avoiding directly doing things at home. We should be doing both, but we shouldn't be calling it offsets. We should be saying this is part of our social compact around a sustainable, healthy climate. And at the same time, we're gonna zero carbon out of our usage in the UC system. You know, we got an email today from the sustainability department at the UC and we had been talking to them for quite a while now trying to get Matt Sinclair, the director of the sustainability department and the co-writer of the carbon neutrality plan, um, climate action plan. And they said that they will not be um, allowing us to talk to Matt Sinclair, but that they will give us a statement. So it's frustrating because their position is clear, which we wanted a clear position, and this definitely shows the clarity of that position, which is that 
They don't want to tell us what's going on. They don't want us to have um, a chance to ask them difficult questions. And um, obviously sustainability and true climate action are not necessarily on the same page at the UC level. We have not solved the immediate problems of some of the on-campus fossil fuel use, particularly natural gas, which I call fossil gas, because that's more accurate at many campuses, at Berkeley, at UCLA, a number of places where there is quite recent investment um, into fossil fuel systems. That has to go. So the UC Berkeley cogen plant is very old. It's at the end of its operational life. When it was installed, um, or when it was upgraded technically in the 90s, it was moving to natural gas, fossil gas, which was better than coal and better than oil. But we knew even back then that was a stopgap measure. And now that renewable energy is cheaper than the fossil plant, and it's not just cheaper when you have to build a new plant. Recent reports that come out of Bloomberg News and others have found that building and operating a new solar or a new wind plant is cheaper than simply operating an existing fossil plant like the steam generation plant on campus. It doesn't take much vision to uh, picture what an electrified campus should look like. Here at UC Berkeley, we're geographically located in a convenient place because there is a, an excellent example of an electrified campus just south of us in the South Bay. It is called Stanford. Uh, Stanford had uh, a gas plant uh, like ours, but they shut it down and electrified. And what that means primarily is that you have to deal with the heating and cooling needs of the campus without burning methane. And the way to do that, and what Stanford did, is to construct big, beautiful uh, heat pumps, electric heat pumps, and also construct storage tanks to store hot and cold water. The heat pumps move heat from one pool of water to the other, so you make hot and cold water and then you can distribute that heating and cooling to campus as the uh, load demands. Along the way, we learned that the state of California had problems of its own. In 2020, the state produced 144 million barrels of crude oil. And beyond this, its history with unrestricted market growth policy has created emblematic fossil fuel extraction and refining sites in Long Beach, Inglewood, Kern County, and the Bay Area that have left numerous communities living among environmental injustice for several generations. Generations that have relied on fossil jobs for sustenance and find it difficult to justly transition into a clean economy. My name is Andres Soto. I am the organizer in Richmond for Communities for a Better Environment. Uh, Communities for a Better Environment is a statewide environmental justice organization where we have been the stone in the shoe of the Chevron Richmond Refinery, uh, which you see right behind me, which is the single largest refinery in Northern California, the single largest greenhouse gas emitting facility in Northern California and the second largest in the state of California. As an environmental justice organization, we are committed to uh, alleviating the environmental injustice burden that has been suffered uh, disproportionately, primarily by communities of color and working class people in industrial areas. Growing up, like, Specifically, like growing up, like black, you'd be like, some issues will happen, and you just be like, damn, life is just like that. <laughs> like really, using like I have asthma, and I grew up in like the West Adams neighborhood, and like my best friend who lives around the corner from me, he also has asthma, and it's just like, damn, we both have asthma. That's unfortunate. But like, I love like come into like learning more about climate change, and learning more about the forces, the human forces specifically behind climate change like pollution from cars, pollution from oil drilling that's done like three miles away from my house. You see that like, these aren't things that just happened to us because we're human, like it wasn't random. It's because not enough has been done to tackle climate change. The UC system really has to decarbonize so that folks like me, folks who look like me, folks who don't look like me, but will suffer the consequences 
of climate change and who aren't even born yet that they don't have to deal with what I'm dealing with and what folks across the world are dealing with. My name is Anna Medell. I am a rising fourth year at UC Berkeley studying environmental science. And I was born and raised in Bakersfield, California. So I lived there my entire life. I'm a huge advocate for climate justice. Um, I personally am a first gen low income student. I am also a Latina. And so there are many environmental justice and climate justice issues that directly affect me and people that I love. Growing up in Kern County, I understand what it means for communities to be burdened with a bunch of pollution. And so moving away from fossil fuels and towards clean energy is something that I truly believe in. I was never really aware of like the issues that were impacting me, impacting my community. But I think the closest thing I ever got to it was being diagnosed with asthma. Like, oh, I have asthma. That's just something that all the kids of Bakersfield get, you know? That's, that wasn't anything new to me. Being able to be educated on a lot of these topics and understand that my position at UC Berkeley can help my community is something that like keeps me motivated and keeps me as an advocate. UC Berkeley relies on oil and gas, but look at where we are. It's such a pretty area. So you know that the impacts that oil and gas and like hydraulic fracking have aren't being seen here, but they are being seen in the communities where fracking is actually happening. So you see it in Richmond with the Chevron Oil and Gas Company. You see that in Kern County with hydraulic fracturing. I'm of the firm belief that the University of California, as one of the major institutions in the state of California, and all the institutions in the state of California, governmental and private sector institutions, need to radically change their understanding, their use, their investment in energy system. We here in Richmond, because of this refinery and its usage of offsets, um, you know, are living and suffering under that system. And I'm proud of the work that we have done collectively to put it on the map as a city moving in a progressive direction, despite the odds that have been set up against us. Economically speaking, Bakersfield is very reliant on the oil and gas industry. And so that kind of reliance that we have as a county really impacts people's perceptions of climate change and what that means for individuals. And so even within my family, I have I have siblings and people and cousins, you know, like that are with that work within these industries, that work within the oil and gas industry, because that's how you make money. That's how you survive. That's how you live. A lot of people bring out this term of a just transition, but I think some people kind of overlook what that actually means. And so to me, that means being able to provide jobs and good wages to the people that are currently working within oil and gas industry positions, especially those that are directly harming them and their health and providing jobs within clean energy industries. How are you going to organize the labor force, particularly when we look at something like the oil sector, which is a dying industry? We're going to see continued contraction within that industry. Um, how is labor going to shift to organize the workers in the emerging renewable sector and use that as a power base to drive investment policy, to drive environmental policy, to drive labor policy that will be made by the different levels of government. And so the labor movement needs to get back in touch with its roots in the community if it's gonna survive and have a positive role in the just transition that all our communities need to see. Labor unions from California, including those from the UC, are organizing to propose alternative futures and have commissioned a study that reveals the feasibility of moving the state, once and for all, away from the extractive economies that are destroying our planet. My background is in plant pathology, so that means I work in a lab that studies plant diseases at UC Davis. I've worked there for six years and I've been a unionized worker there for four years through my union, which is called the University Professional and Technical Employees, or UPDI. The great news about my union is that it is very member-led and member-run. So I didn't have to be an expert in labor history. I didn't have to be an expert in Green New Deal work to be able to form the Green New Deal Committee with many other members across the state and to get to work to address climate problems on the UC campuses. 
I'm Brooke Donner. I work um, at the University of California, San Diego in a psychology research lab. Um, I'm also one of the vice presidents for the University Professional and Technical Employees, Local 9, and I'm one of the founding members and um, a co-chair of UPTI's Green New Deal Committee. Hi, I'm Susan Orlovsky. I'm a retiree of UC San Diego. I worked for about 27 years. I am still active in my union UPTI, CWA 9119, um, serving right now as recording secretary. Unions are the ground floor for determining how we're going to move into a regenerative economy away from the extractive economy that we're a part of right now. Our workers strongly support a Green New Deal and a just transition. When we ask them on a scale of one to five, five being the strongest support, how strongly do you support a Green New Deal? Over 50% selected five, and over 75% selected four or five. So our workers are very on board with the tenets of a Green New Deal, which is essentially rebuilding a regenerative economy. They're also at roughly the same levels in support of a just transition. Unionized workers play a huge role in the current oil and gas industry. Those folks understandably do not want to transition away from those highly protected high wage jobs into solar and wind jobs, which currently have very low rates of unionization and pay less well. About 4% of solar energy workers, people who actually install solar panels, and about 6% of wind energy workers are in fact unionized currently. Um, their average pay in California is about $85,000. The average pay for a fossil fuel worker who is unionized typically is $130,000. So increasing the unionization rates of people working in clean energy will raise their wages. It will ensure that they get decent cost of living adjustments. It will ensure that they have good workplace protections. And it will make those jobs more attractive to people who are are working in the fossil fuel industry and allow them to consider a future in the green energy economy. The unions built the middle class in this country and um, now that unions have really declined, we're losing our middle class. We know that if we don't have a seat at the table, we could very well be on the menu. So understanding the concerns of many different labor partners and advocating for them for the workers rather than the bosses, <laughs> rather than these multinational companies, advocating for the workers to ensure that they have meaningful work in a green economy and being able to stand in solidarity with them is a really key thing that our union wants to do as well as many other unions around California. And I'm so excited to say that UPTI is a part of California Labor for Climate Jobs, which is a consortium of 20 different unions. Um, it includes teachers, nurses, steel workers who actually operate at three different locations um, in California. They operate at refineries, um, engineers, public sector workers, service workers. And we've all come together to advocate for a just transition. We want us all to work together to come up with solutions that are relevant, both on a regional level and on a state level. Because we need our government to really step up here and provide a framework for all of this to happen. Such a framework has already been outlined in a recent report done by Dr. Robert Pollan, an economist from University of Massachusetts Amherst, in which he proposes a feasible way to transition our state's dependency on fossil jobs into a clean energy economy. Pollan's findings suggest that by spending $138 billion, or 4% of California's GDP, per year for the next 10 years, we would be able to create 1 million green jobs and allow the state to equitably transition 3,200 oil and gas workers per year into a regenerative future. If 3.8% or 4% of state GDP per year sounds like a big number to spend on building a regenerative economy and all these green jobs, I want to highlight that the amount we're spending already to survive the many ecological disasters we live through is already too high. We cannot afford to not spend this money to build a new green economy in California. It is worth it and it is a bargain. The UC is one of the largest employers in the state of California, which is in its own right, one of the largest economies in the world. Um, so a lot of what happens at the UC affects the rest of like the labor market in California and in the United States. But also the UC likes to position itself as, as a leader in public education and in research in medicine and science. I think if they want to claim that, then they have a lot to do to walk the walk to match their talk. 
Some people don't think that their union is a viable place to seek climate justice and climate action. And your union is one of the best places you can do that. Climate action doesn't mean like you need to join the Sierra Club. Climate action doesn't mean that you need to become an activist and be in the street. Climate action means you start from where you are and what you're good at. And you work on that together with people you care about. And sometimes that's, how, that's what work is for you. And so you can start at work. As our working conditions change as a result of climate change, unions need to respond and the power of unions really lies in, in our collective strength and if we're able to respond together and as a single force, we will get a lot more done. There is no path in reaching any of our stated climate goals while we continue to burn gas for energy. We need to rapidly shift away from fossil fuels if we want a livable future. I've been at UCSD for 18 years in the physics department. Most of that time I've spent looking at astrophysical problems and doing tests of general relativity. I have taught a course on energy and the environment during that whole period and recently wrote a textbook because I'm very concerned about these issues. I'm actually transitioning my research into this domain fully. I'm interested in the question of what can we do for another 10,000 years? And what we're doing right now is not it. Almost nothing that we do today can be happening still in 10,000 years. It's not just a tech fix. It has to also come from us and how we uh, appreciate the energy we have and use it very wisely. Of course, that leads you to the question of, well, oh my God, everything has to change. Well, everything does have to change because everything did change to put us where we are today. So it's entirely possible that human societies can change because we change all the time and we did towards what we live in today. And the problem for humans really is we become habituated to certain ways of life and expectations as normal. And so we can't imagine what something, some other normal might be. And I think our responsibility in the university is to begin to help elucidate and um, create different conceptual frames for a different future. To combat institutional um, structures that are really stuck in the 20th century and based, uh, uh, that evolved around carbon intensive um, ways of living is a political question. Um, no change that I know of in the world um, has ever happened without political mobilization and the power of people demanding a change. You've got to contemplate the uh, wholesale reconfiguration of the stable climate that has sustained humans throughout all of civilization, and that's just stressful to think about. To do something about it, you have to do something unusual. You have to go out on a limb and do something different. And being different is hard. So it's, um, it's, it's difficult to say no to flying when everyone else is flying. Or it's difficult to get an electric car or electrify your home when no one else in your neighborhood is doing it. Or it's difficult to be the one person at the Regents meeting asking about those carbon offsets. Um, and so it can feel lonely. But there are millions of people around the planet who are going out on a limb to fight this thing. And you need only connect with a handful of them to start to feel part of a community. So instead of being a single person out on a limb, uh, you're part of a team of explorers that are uh, charting a course, a course that might just save the planet as we know it. What gets in our way is money. So it's the price tag is enormous. And we make our decisions based on money. Money is a terrible metric for making good decisions. So it's an amoral system. But that's how all decisions are made. And if we can overlook the sort of financial hardships and make this happen despite the large price tag, it might be the first time it's happened but at this scale, but that's what has to happen. 
And we have to call for our leadership to prioritize the public health of communities, the well-being of students, workers' rights, divestment of fossil fuels through banks, and those already impacted by the worst of climate change over aspirations of endless growth. Uh, my name is Alex Andriotis. I'm a PhD student at Scripps at UCSD. The university has, as its basic tenant, is to provide education. So the students, as sort of this thing that the university is built around, uh, are able to say what they like or don't like about the university's behavior. And the university has a responsibility to listen to that. Students are very hard to retaliate against. Um, for their activism, unlike staff and untenured faculty. I think students, relative to their power, have a, a very big capacity to uh, affect change. It's been interesting to take classes at Berkeley, especially with my classes that focus specifically on environmental science, because it's it feels scary <laughs> to think that a lot of the students that are currently here don't really know a lot of the things that are going on so like different topics will be brought up during class like kind of like what's going on with chevron in richmond or with uh hydraulic fracking in kern county and then the students will kind of respond i didn't know that was going on it's just surprising to hear and to see that even students at uc berkeley can be oblivious to like the real the reality of what climate change is and what it does to different communities UC Riverside, for example, like they have a horrible pollution there as well, and yet it's still do 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 like we're gonna move hella slow on climate change, even though our own campuses and then even like although most folks come from like California, our students who come from the Central Valley, and then even our out of state students who may even live in those communities, they're like being infected by the emissions from extracting methane or fracked natural gas, whatever. That's where we're getting our energy from. That's how we're powering, powering our residence halls, our um, dining halls, our lecture halls, like all that's being powered by other communities. And so by decarbonizing the UC campus, we may not exactly like, our air may be the same over UC San Diego, but folks in other communities are gonna like be able to breathe cleaner air and therefore they're going to live a longer life, they're going to live a better life. And so by decarbonizing campus, we're helping out folks across the campus. And that's really our job as like UC system, like we're doing research to help out the world. And so we should be decarbonizing our campus to help out the world. I think it's UCSD's responsibility to go fossil free because we are such a big institution and we are supposedly supporting all of these efforts for the environment but they're not showing that in their actions. And they can make a really big change because of how much scope they have over students and faculty and just California and the UC system in general. If we can't do this, if we can't show the path to a fossil free campus, what hope do any of us have? I think there's two reasons why the UC both intellectually and morally needs to move well beyond carbon neutrality and recognize that we don't need to wait till 2025 or later, we can do it right now. And that is the low cost of clean energy and the research results coming out of all of the UC campuses and the natural reserve systems and the national labs, all of which are saying that the climate crisis is not only upon us now, but the costs will get worse and worse. What we might have forgotten recently, especially in a world battling disease, racial oppression, and an endless overlap of environmental and social injustices, is that we already have power, and not the alienating sense of power given to us by commodities, but the power harnessed in the wisdom of the social movements of the past, as well as the science and intellect of today. It is through these diverse knowledge systems that we can transform our eco-anxiety and socio-political angst into the action needed to uncover a faceless system. Social movements are the tool we have to demand accountability from the extractive industries that have put our planet in a state of collapse. As we truly step into the 21st century, 
our strength lies in demanding a shift from the local institutions and communities that we have a voice in. A shift that moves beyond sustainability and neutrality and instead makes a stand to keep fossil fuels in the ground and regenerate our ecosystems and their inhabitants one by one. To make the change, we will also need to accept the multiple ways in which fossil fuels play a role in our lives. Most of us living in the Western world need to accept our complicity and understand that we too must adapt. As we do this, new energy systems, ideologies, and ethical economies will emerge. And with these, our voices will find more reach. An alternative future is possible, but only if we realize that environmental justice concerns us all, and that from any place where we stand now, the impact of climate change will be real. From where we stand, we demand a fossil-free UC.